from 155 into the breeze. Hey there, that's a deuce. first leg of this trip was very different than the second leg. I went from playing an ungodly amount of golf in a very short period of time with a group of six buddies in Australia to taking an extended solo road trip around New Zealand. And I actually didn't even play that much golf. But the golf courses I did visit here were unlike anything I'd ever seen before. One of them in particular was so special that it's actually getting its own episode. Uh, more on that later. But for the purposes of this episode, we're going to focus on my visit to Kari Cliffs and Cape Kidnappers and everything else in between, which actually turned out to be a lot. For some reason in my mind, New Zealand was a lot closer to Australia than it actually is. I was shocked to see that it's actually two time zones east and the flight from Melbourne to Auckland was about three and a half hours. I've never really considered New Zealand a golf destination, and even after seeing some of these unique and bold designs on some of the best land and most picturesque backdrops that I'd ever seen in one place, I still wouldn't call it a golf destination. It's more of just a badass place to visit. It's got some incredible golf courses, but they're in pretty remote parts of the country, a lot of driving in between, but thankfully there's so much to see and do in between that you kind of forget about the long commutes. I had seen pictures of Kari Cliffs and Cape Kidnappers in golf magazines over the years, and to me, New Zealand just felt like this faraway place that really wasn't on Earth. It's so remote that there's actually a Reddit forum with about 45,000 subscribers just titled Maps Without New Zealand. It's almost a forgotten part of the world. Seeing as how it's not really close to anything, people from New Zealand, when they do travel, they sometimes go on trips that last six months, nine months, maybe even a year. That's actually where I met my friends, Ben and Rita. We met on a safari in Namibia. They were on about a nine month long trip and they were pretty much run ragged by the time we did meet up. When I told them I was gonna visit them in New Zealand, they offered me a place to stay, probably thinking I wouldn't actually follow through with it. They fired up a Kiwi barbecue and gave me a chance to ask the really important questions about their neighbors to the West. What's the biggest difference between Australians and Kiwis? Intelligence. Oh. <laughs> You're um, better at that. <laughs> we say fish and chips properly. How do they say it? Fish and chips. <laughs> do you know the origins of Australia? That they're all convicts? <laughs> yeah, we chose to come here. They got sent here. <laughs> <laughs> and then they also claim to have invented all the things that we invented. Like? Like pavlova. Not gonna lie, I think they're winning. They're, this is some pretty weak trash talk. <laughs> After a few days in the capital out on boats and surviving a stalled engine of said boat, I was off on the road trip, this time six hours straight north to the northern tip of the North Island where the Tasman Sea meets the Pacific Ocean. The six hour drive ended up actually being a lot longer. There's signs for waterfalls and I took every opportunity I could to pull off, check them out and soak up the scenery up along the way. And it was quickly evident to me as to why so many people visit New Zealand on an annual basis. I kept driving further north and further north, stop and talk to some locals. Right. You gonna catch any fish today? Uh, no, I don't. No? I might go catch a beer. Yeah, go for some beer. <laughs> the last stretch of this drive is winding through rainforest that just feels uninhabited and you're wondering how they even built a road through it or why they built a road, but I'm guessing this is probably why. These islands are famous for having very volatile weather, so with a perfect night and an empty golf course, I thought this might be a good time to sneak out to Kari Cliffs early and catch some of this footage. It proved to be a good decision. The similarities between Kari Cliffs and its sister course, Cape Kidnappers, will be very evident by the end of this video, mostly because the developer of both properties is American Julian Robertson. Robertson was a successful stockbroker who once retired to New Zealand for a year to write a novel, came back and started the firm Tiger Management, and eventually turned $8 million into $22 billion and still maintains a net worth of $4 billion to this day. 
similarities between Kari Cliffs and Cape Kidnappers are clear, especially when it comes to the wow factor. You're probably getting the idea at this point with all the drone porn, but the cliffs are magnificent. You can't take your eyes off the water, and considering you see the water from 15 of the 18 holes at Kari Cliffs, the golf kind of just becomes kind of secondary. I mean, it's basically like Jurassic Park, but just a little bit wilder. Despite a clear forecast for my round the next morning, we were hit with rain pretty early. I started the round out by myself, but in style, dunking a 7-iron from 155 yards on the second hole for a deuce. I made sure to flag down the attention of the two gentlemen standing on the third tee so that someone could at least verify the eagle, and they shortly asked me to join them right after, which definitely added to the experience. Ewan and Peter are two Kiwis that are used to paying a lot less for a round of golf than you do pay at Kari Cliffs, but once a year they splurge and they chose this day for that. Of all the people I saw that day, they were the only two people there that did not play this course in a golf cart. Considering they were about 30 years my senior, that was a bit humbling. I still am not sure how they did it. And as much as I enjoy walking, if I was doing it again, I would definitely take a cart again. Getting to spend the day with a couple locals definitely added to the experience, and by the end of the round, they were pretty comfortable letting me know what they think of all of the visitors that come to their country. This is New Zealand, <laughs> N-E-W-Z-E-A-L-A-N-D. You're welcome to come here as long as you don't immigrate. <laughs> <laughs> the first big reveal is the stunning par 3 7th. This is the only seaside hole that plays with the water to its right. It has an exhilarating carry over this canyon you see here. Typically, when I know the camera's on me, I'm going to twirl it and act like it's good no matter what. But this actually, this I actually stuffed this one. I missed the 5-footer for birdie, but still, this was, this was a deserved club twirl if there ever was one. First 13 holes on the course are basically one extended crescendo. You get glimpses of the ocean and the views along the way, but everything builds towards the stretch from the 14th tee all the way down to the 17th green. From there, it's all downhill. You don't realize until you get to that green site just how far down the hill you've traversed from that 14th tee box. This is easily the most memorable stretch of the golf course and it's got a mixture of everything from the long par 3 14th hole, the reachable par 5 15th, the drivable par 4 16th, and then the long and tough par 4 17th. The 16th is especially memorable. It's a somewhat drivable par 4 with a bit of helping wind, but it's a tough carry. Trust me, I learned that the hard way. But for me, the best hole in the golf course is the 17th. It's long, it's tough, and you're driving again over a canyon to a perched fairway and a long approach back to this green site. And when someone mentions Kari Cliffs, I think of that 17th hole, that journey down the hill, and that tree that sits behind that green. While both sit on the North Island of New Zealand, the drive from Kari Cliffs to Cape Kidnappers is pretty much the exact same time it would take you to drive from Pinehurst up to Long Island to Bethpage. It's not close at all. It's over nine hours, and thankfully there's a lot to see and do along the way. Even if you haven't heard of Cape Kidnappers, you've probably seen these pictures before, whether you realize it or not. I don't even know exactly what to describe this. I think fingers of the cape is kind of how they describe it. But regardless, here is the back nine at Cape Kidnappers in all of its glory. Once you leave the main road and enter the gate to the Cape Kidnappers property, it's actually about a 15 minute drive to the clubhouse, traversing streams and there's bridges and there's mountains that you gotta drive over. You're on site, but it doesn't feel like it yet. And actually the first time that Tom Doak saw the land that would ultimately become the golf course, he was unsure that they could get construction equipment to this part of the property to actually build the golf course. The back nine is what Cape Kidnappers is known for and was very surprised at how much intrigue and interest there was in the front nine. There's a ton of land movement on that side. It's a bit even more dramatic. The holes have more depth to them and Doak just had more land to work with than he does on some of the tight fingers on the back nine. I was prepared for the views. I was prepared for the cliff height, which is about 400 feet high. I was not prepared for the crystal blue water. It looks more like the Caribbean than it does something you would see in the ocean. Both the 10th and the 12th are long par fours that today we're playing into the wind and both green sites just sit incredibly against the horizon as if they're just falling off into the water right behind them. One of my favorite holes on the back nine is actually the shortest one, the par three 13th. See here for Tom Doak's comment about how they almost built this green 80 feet below the current green site, but it looked like it might be a old ancient Mori site down there. It would have been pretty thrilling if the green site was down there, but if Tom Doak's not willing to do it, I'm guessing that it actually probably wasn't physically possible. You go away from the coast for the drivable par 4 14th, 
and then the signature hole, the 15th, 650 yards. Not only was it windy, it was coming off of the coast. I know I saw a clip back from the 2009 Kiwi Challenge where Anthony Kim hit a six iron over the 650 yard par five 15th hole. I hit driver three wood, three wood. And if I'm gonna mention in the beginning of this video about how I made an eagle two, I probably should mention that I doubled this one. And just when you think it doesn't get any more absurd, you walk back to the location of the 16th tee. There's, there's just no business putting a tee box all the way back here, but you're rewarded with one of the cooler tee shots. Even though you're facing away from the water, this is one of the most memorable shots you hit all day. Your eyes get accustomed to seeing the dramatic land movements and the ocean views, and it's easy to forget how difficult it is to build golf courses on pieces of land like this. There's a reason why it doesn't get done all around the world. It's what helps make Kari Cliffs and Cape Kidnapper so special. It's exotic, it's wild, and it's no wonder why you always see these courses ranked so highly on world top 100 lists. After wrapping up my day at Cape Kidnappers, the golf portion of this trip was over. Unprepared and unequipped, I set out on the Tangariro Alpine Crossing, a 10-hour hike that probably should have done a little more research for. Probably should have known when the guy asked if I was really going to walk it in jeans that that was probably a bad idea. Probably should have taken an extra layer. It got a bit windy, and I probably should have brought more water. Other than that, I think I pretty much nailed it. But these are the things you need to budget time for if you're doing a golf trip to New Zealand. It's stuff like this every corner you turn, and you could spend a month there and not see it all. Fortunately for me, my trip was not over. But more on that next week. Listen, as cool as Kari Cliffs and Cape Kidnappers were, next week we are taking it to an entirely different level. I've never seen a course just completely nail the setting, the vibe, the intrigue, and the design all into one like I did at Terra Edie. What do you call this in New Zealand? What? What is this? This? Yeah. This is your chili bin. Chili bin. Chili bin. Chili bin. And that's just bin. Bin. So what do you call that place right there? McDonald's. No, you don't. Mecca's? Mecca's. Do you guys not call it Mecca's? Nobody calls it Mecca's. Oh.